Um, and I can't promise anything um, apart from that some of what I say may or may not be tangentially related to some things that you've heard today. Um, on, on the subject of worlds and worlds colliding, I often think about a quote um, from... Um, Bertrand Russell wrote this down in his biography, autobiography uh, uh, regarding his teacher, Alfred North Whitehead. And he says, uh, and Alfred North Whitehead was a, a, was a remarkable mathematician and a philosopher, uh, and, and a um, philosopher who um, started to grapple with metaphysical questions and whose, whose thinking is very, very helpful for, for a lot of people, um, including myself. And um, anyway, so Russell reports this, and, and Whitehead says to Russell, um, you think the world is what it is at noon on a summer's day. But I think the world is what it seems to be at dawn when I first wake from deep sleep. And I just find it so helpful to think about the different ways that we are always structuring our meetings together, our meetings with other organisms, uh, and. Um, and, and other geological and, and, and biophysical forces um, from the perspective that we bring. And, 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 and those worlds can be many, um, uh, uh, including if they're the same world, just at different times, like the noonday or the dawn. So that's one thing that I, I, I thought of when I saw this, um, the title of this event. But <clears throat> another thing that I think about when I, when I think about these questions going on in psychedelic worlds right now is... Um, there's a friend, a friend of mine that is a philosopher and a magician and ecologist called David Abram, and um, I've known him since he was very small, and when I was a kid, he used to do uh, coin tricks for me, very amazing. The walk, walking of coins in his fingers, they'd vanish, reappear where they shouldn't be, uh, and, and just be totally bewildering, uh, and, um, and many hours I spent transfixed. And he won, one of his past lives, he was um, the house magician in Alice's Restaurant in Massachusetts. It's uh, famous from the Arlo Guthrie song, some of you may know. Um, Alice, uh, David tells me, had a big ruby inset into one of her front teeth and was a remarkable character. And um, he would be going around the tables doing magic tricks, these coin sleights of hands. And um, after a while, uh, after a while on the job, he, he started to notice a pattern where people who he'd been doing these tricks for would go outside um, having paid the bill and then come back in looking puzzled and say, what did you do to us? Did you put anything on our drink? And he said, no, of course not. I'm not that, I'm not that guy. Um, I was just doing tricks. Um, and they're just tricks. And, um, and he said, well, because when we went outside, the sky was bluer than it was when we came in. Uh, the rain was colder on our skin. Uh, the pavement was more vivid. And we started to notice the cracks in the sidewalk. And, and we realized these trees were there, and they were so big. Uh, all this kind of thing. And he realized after a while that what was going on was that these tricks, um, that, that our perceptions work by expectation so much of the time. We, we, it's easier for our uh, cognitive systems to make sense of the world by, um, by updating our understanding with small new pieces of sensory information rather than reforming perceptions every time from scratch. Um, and so um, the, these coin tricks are loosening the grip of our expectations about how we expect the world to happen. So when the coin is not there and not there and not there yet again, your expectations, which govern so much of your sensory experience, start to, um, well, they're rendered a little bit useless and they peel off. And, um, and when you go outside, everything is more vivid because you see what's actually there rather than what you expected to be there. The familiar becomes unfamiliar again. And I think this is very, very important for lots and lots of things that, that humans do. Um, and whether it be uh, in the arts or the sciences or in just one's personal life or going outside or talking, or whatever we do, um, things that can render the familiar unfamiliar again um, are some of the most important and valuable um, experiences. And psychedelics can do this, and so can many other things. Um, so, when I, think about, um, when I think about psychedelic experiences myself, I, I feel this sense of expansion. When, I, when, when I've had psychedelic experiences in the past, my mind has occurred to me as a much larger place than I'd given it credit to be. It's as if I'd just been spending time in the garden 
uh, of my mind, and I suddenly realized that there was a gate at the end of the garden which led out onto, uh, into a field, which led into a forest, which led into a mountain range, which led into a continent, and all of that was somewhere that I could explore, or begin to explore. And so many of the boundaries and the categories that I had unintentionally or intentionally used to organize my existence and my thinking and my uh, behaviors um, seemed to melt away. And I think this is a very important thing, a very important part of uh, these experiences. And I think there are so many ways that the questions that we come back to today, these questions about you know, science and spirituality, science and the arts, and, um, they come from this, this bifurcation uh, of, of, of you know, the primary quantities, the measurable primary quantities, and the secondary qualities. This very basic uh, bifurcation, Whitehead called it, uh, a, sort of the, the, a very foundational um, dualism in modern scientific thinking. Um, uh, and, um, and it's left us with all sorts of problems and created all sorts of boundaries that we stumble over, mistaking them for natural features of our minds. And uh, the boundary, I think, dividing the sciences and the arts, science and poetry, uh, science and spirituality, um, subject, object. There are so many vexed dualities that structure our experience and which create problems for us again and again and again. Um, and so these boundary dissolving experiences, these experiences at least can remind us that the boundaries that we use to organize our lives are, are, are those that have been put in place most of the time by humans um, and that we don't have to always be structured by them. Uh, and, and experiences that can help us to see that are, are, are very, very valuable. So Personally, um, I find the study of the living world a very exciting place, uh, an exciting, exciting way to, to start to break down some of these boundaries. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about fungi from, um, from the perspective of, um, well, fungi that aren't psychedelic fungi, um, because I figured that there'd been some discussion of, of the psychedelic fungi today. Um, and I spend a lot of time thinking about these organisms, and, and some of the most exciting things for me about these organisms are the ways that they... Um, that thinking about them makes the world look different, that the familiar can become unfamiliar again, that they can dissolve, decompose many of these um, stale, um, brittle, old, sclerotized categories that we use to organize our lives, our philosophies, our economies, our politics. And, um, <clears throat> and that they can lead us into all sorts of new and exciting places. Um, one of these places, for me, has been study of symbiosis, the way that different organisms uh, are constantly inventing um, new ways to live alongside one another, that the history of life is a history of wild intimacies, complex wild intimacies. And fungi are symbiotic, um, virtuosic beings who have found themselves as players in many of the most world-changing um, relationships um, to date the evolution of land plants being one example. And the plants' ancestors in freshwater rivers and streams could only make it onto land with the help of fungi, which behaved as their root systems for tens of millions of years until plants could evolve their own roots. And so these fungal relationships are a more fundamental part of planthood than leaves or flowers or fruit or wood, uh, and set the stage for the entire evolutionary history of life on land, of which we're a part. So this kind of symbiotic relationship, relationships when you realize the more you think about it, that, that this is what life is. It's relationship all the way down. Um, you know, bacteria have smaller bacteria living inside them sometimes, and large viruses can have smaller viruses inside them, and uh, fungi have bacteria living inside them, which themselves have viruses living inside them. Um, it's just relationship uh, all the way down as far as you go. And, and this way of thinking, and thinking about these relationships not as the, 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 the way that we might immediately start thinking about these relationships is as the relationships between two different entities, um, then they form a connection between them, like drawing a line between two, two circles on a page. Um, and that's all very well, but these symbiotic relationships over evolutionary time are more uh, wild than that. It's more like Escher's drawing hands. I don't know if you've seen this picture. I'm sure some of you have. Of, well, the hand, one hand drawing the other hand. Um, and that these... But organisms arise out of these relationships. These relationships are very generative, and, uh, and something is 
formed, which was not there in the previous um, parts. Those two players stop to be just those players and become something um, different that um, can do new things, um, that opens up creative possibilities for these organisms. And this happens again and again and again uh, in the history of life. And um, so, um, let's see how long, oh yes. Um, and so, <clears throat> thinking like this, thinking about uh, all the ways that we form relationships, thinking about all the ways that we um, are led into relationships, to think about the ways that um, our views of networks as um, items linked up by lines uh, presupposes a worldview in which we've separated them into separate entities. And there are lots of organisms that it makes no sense to do this with. So lichens, for example, are, are wonderful symbiotic organisms. And many of you would have seen them. They're quite uh, unassuming um, for most people. Uh, very assuming for those who, who pay attention to them. And um, they're made up of fungi and algae and bacteria. And, um, and they are um, no part of, no, no player in the lichen creates any structure that resembles the lichen. So it's a bit like the elements in, in, in water, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen are two flammable gases that come together to make water, uh, a compound with properties quite unlike those of, their, uh, those of its constituent atoms, elements. So um, lichens are, are an example of this, and are symbiotic icons, and are some ways that actually fungi have impacted uh, the history of one scientific thought, because the word symbiosis was brought into the sciences to describe lichens. And because before that, there wasn't, in the late 19th century, there, there wasn't a way, there wasn't a word to describe the, living, the generative living together of organisms. There were only words to describe parasitism and disease. So, this concept of symbiosis, where, you, where, where, where it was an ag agnostic concept, like it, they might be, it's a, it's a spectrum, right? So you can have parasitism on one pole, and you can have mutualism on another pole, where both partners benefit. But, but to have a word where we could understand that relationships in the living world were uh, not necessarily pathological. Um, this was a big moment. Um, the discovery of mycorrhizal fungi followed soon after, as did corals, the symbiotic nature of corals. Um, and so... I see this as one example, one of the ways that fungi have led, um, led a collective kind of us into um, uh, new ways of thinking, changing our minds, inviting us to question uh, the world that we see in making the familiar unfamiliar again. Another way that I think fungi can be helpful um, is by um, reminding us about process, the processual nature of reality. The assumption, um, a sort of reigning assumption, is very rarely discussed within scientific worlds. It's, but it's, a, it's a kind of substance view. You might call it a substance ontology. That, that the world's made up of stuff. When you boil it all down, it's things. And, and, and things and the relationships between things. But a process view, which is more in line with what modern physics says, would say that, no, when you boil it down, it's, it's matter and it's energy bound within fields. It's, 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 it's a process in time unfolding. There's no sort of hard stuff about it. Um, these processes can come together to form stable structures uh, as we are ourselves. But if you think about yourself, the matter that makes you up is constantly flowing through you. You're a field of stability through which matter is passing. The you of five years ago is made up of different stuff than the you of today. And this is the case with the whole living world and indeed the whole universe, if you are a physicist. Um, and fungi remind us of this because their mycelial lives are, there's no body plan. These are bodies with no body plan. They're constantly growing, uh, remodeling themselves, uh, reshaping themselves. And, um, and this, this astonishing, perplexing, puzzling fluidity of form um, is um, something which I think can teach us a, a great deal and which I enjoy uh, thinking about um, and could talk about for, for, for much longer. But I just wanted to finish quickly with, in this subject of relationships. There's a, there's a guy called uh, a scholar, a, a heterodox revisionist uh, scholar of prehistory called M.J. Harper. And I don't know if any of you have read his work, but I, I find him very exciting because he's, um, he's insistently um, thinking about old problems from new angles. Uh, and and he I heard him talk, and he described this remarkable thing. He was trying to deal with this question of how did ancient mariners, so there's a Bronze Age, there was tin and copper being, copper from Wales, tin from Cornwall, both need to make um, bronze, and this bronze is being shipped around the Mediterranean, um, complex networks of sea trade, um, seafarers, um, and 
he was trying to wrestle with the question of how was it that people could get from Cornwall to France with these heavily loaded boats reliably with no compasses, no maps, and no um, written language that we know of. And, um, and so he, he said, well, most people just don't bother asking the question. But his answer to the question, which I, I love, whether or not it's true doesn't matter for me, but um, he, he'd found in a straight line a kind of, uh, uh, from um, somewhere in Cornwall um, across the Channel Islands, and on these Channel Islands there are these pools which are called Venus pools. They're, they're pools in the rock. Um, and people say, oh, they're just natural features of the rock, but they, there are only a couple of them, and they happen to exist. In, if you draw a line from this port, old port in France to the place in Cornwall, they, they're both on that line, these islands with Venus pools. And so he had this idea. He's like, I think what they did was put bread uh, or food or fish. No, fish would get trapped in there, and they'd augment it with food to feed the fish at high tide. When the tide receded, these pools would be full of fish, and the cormorants would come to feed, and the cormorants would know exactly what time of day to come to feed at these pools, like shooting fish in a barrel for the cormorants. Um, and they would fly between Venus pool to Venus pool. So if you were a mariner, all you'd have to do is follow the river of cormorants in the sky, <laughs> moving in a straight line from A to B. And of course, if this was true, it may or may not be true, um, but if it was true, then it would leave no trace in the archaeological record. And it wouldn't be written down, so there's no writing. So what it just got me thinking about were all of the wonderful ways that, I mean, we know about this, I mean, know about the stories of domestications of, of plants and animals and how this has changed human history, but I just love thinking about all of these relationships that we might have known about or had before that we've forgotten about, and all of the relationships that will inevitably arise in the future, um, because life is relationship. And so I enjoy thinking about the, the, you know, these possibilities based on um, what may or may not have happened in the past, but, uh, but this focus on relationship I find very important. Fungi can take us to that place and can help us to think about new ways that we might form relationships, um, unusual relationships uh, with organisms in the living world um, so that both parties can extend their reach. So I wonder in general whether we can keep our focus broad uh, so that we are always paying attention to context, whether we can pay attention to the relationships between entities as much as the entities doing the relating. I wonder whether we can um, lean into ambiguity without trying to force a resolution one way or another. I wonder whether um, we can maintain a healthy suspicion of ideologies that fetishize reduction at all costs. I wonder uh, whether we can um, continue to find excitement in that which we don't know. I believe all these things are, are, are possible and can help us uh, move forward in this space and in other spaces as well. Thank you.